So this seminar event uh, is a collaboration between IPS Heart and Health Seminar, Mahidol University, Mahidol Migration Center, Joint Research Unit, uh, C Junction, and Global Alliance Against Traffic in Women. And my name is Patra Paul Zimlesili, uh, today's moderator from IPSR, Mahidol University. Uh, we are honored uh, to welcome Hun Panida to give a talk on survivor justice, confronting sex trafficking cases from Thailand to Europe and the United States. And Panita Jansa is directing attorney at the Thai Community Development Center, uh, where she manages to, del to uh, the del delivery of comprehensive social and legal services for the victims of human trafficking. And she currently serves as a commissioner on the California Access to Justice Commission. This talk has simultaneous interpretation from English to Thai provided by Bangkok-based uh, freelance journalist she was formerly a slavery and trafficking correspondent for the Thomson Reuters Foundation and is a professional interpreter. Um, this talk will present on the international sex trafficking scheme that was exposed during 2016 to 2021 and trafficking hundreds of Thai women across Europe and the US. Um, today, our speakers will detail the lessons learned uh, from the case, the session will include also interactive discussion on how victim service providers, are, as well as law enforcement, can work together in a victim-centric and trauma-informed space to ensure justice. Our speakers will have 30 minutes for the talk and followed by 30 minutes uh, discussion, and we will close with a general Q&A from the audience. So without any further ado, may I give the floor to Mijanza. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we could have the presentation. So let me see if I can start my video. Oh, here I am. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning in Thailand. It's um, in the evening here in Los Angeles. Um, we, the Thai Community Development Center, is based in Los Angeles. And we actually focus on community economic development, um, but also provide human rights advocacies because of the many cases of human trafficking that we've encountered since our founding nearly 30 years ago. So, as I mentioned, we engage in a lot of um, community economic development, and you know this is very close to our mission. Um, because we are in the U.S. really trying to make sure that low and moderate income Thai people and other ethnic communities in Los Angeles um, are more economically mobile. And because we serve the most vulnerable, many Thai nationals who end up in the United States are um, victims of labor exploitation and uh, many times they are victims of human trafficking in both sex and labor and Thai CDC uh, is here to assist those victims to uh, find justice for them and it all started back in 1995 one year after Thai CDC was founded we encountered the El Monte Thai garment slavery case and this was this is widely known as the first transnational modern day slavery case in the United States. And this was a garment case where 72 workers, um, this is an actual picture. This is the condo unit um, of townhouses where the traffickers, which was a family lived. And also those victims lived in separate units and had to work day and night um, at sewing machines. And Thai CDC was there when this house or this townhouse complex was raided by law enforcement. And um, since then, we have been helping victims of human trafficking. Um, and, you know, the we always point this out, but the, the ironic thing about this real photo is that there's a welcome to friendly El Monte sign right outside that uh, townhouse complex. Um, and that case actually led 
to the passage of the legislation, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, where we draw upon for the definition of modern day slavery and trafficking in persons. Now, uh, I think Tanya did a great job of identifying, you know, the whole um, map in terms of how the investigative process went for Homeland Security investigations. Um, but, you know, just as a reminder, we came in later on this case because what happened was we learned about the case from a community member who had a friend who was a victim of the case, but they were actually arrested and being held in an immigration detention facility. And once we talked to that victim, they explained to us what happened to them and we were able to get them out of that detention facility so that they could be identified properly as a victim of human trafficking and not just an undocumented immigrant in the United States. Um, and because we've been working on trafficking issues with law enforcement, we had those connections to call upon uh, another Homeland Security Investigations agent to flag what was going on at that detention facility and ultimately was connected back to Tanya's team that was leading the way in investigating this sex trafficking enterprise. Shortly after we had identified that victim, um, I connected with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Minneapolis and was able to connect with additional victims that had been identified, but, you know, because they didn't understand what was going on, there was a lot of fear and um, confusion about what their role was and what types of victim benefits that they would be eligible for and that they weren't in trouble. I think a lot of them just thought that they were in trouble from the get-go, um, but we were able to work very closely with the investigative team. Um, and this photo is one of the press conferences that I had attended um, with the past US attorney over there. Now, at the Thai Community Development Center, we focus on victim-centric and trauma-informed services. And this is very important because all of the cases that come to the Thai Community Development Center, and over the years, I think we've served over 2,000 victims, um, it's, it's really their fight. And although we can advocate for them, we can represent them, um, if they decline services, it's really their choice. Um, but I think the first step to really understanding how to help these types of victims is understanding what their wants and needs are and asking them what their goals are. Because sometimes we, we know what we can do for them and we want the best for them, but it's not our choice as victim advocates. It's the victim's choice. Um, but in terms of... Um, trauma-informed services, it's really interesting because of the trauma that some of these victims go through, especially in sex trafficking cases, we have to keep in mind that there are particular sensitivities that we won't normally understand. For example, some of the victims um, could not stay in hotels because that was where they had been forced to stay for you know, long periods of time to engage in commercial sex acts. Um, and it was, you know, we would have to find alternate housing for them, or, um, you know, sometimes we want to help them heal through things like yoga. So we have to engage those trauma-informed yoga instructors so that they kind of avoid certain positions or make sure that, um, you know, those sensitivities are uh, thought out and considered in an intentional way. Uh, but beyond the basic social service needs that we can provide at Thai CDC, and you know, Thai CDC does not work alone. We would never be able to help all the victims that we have over the years if we did. Um, but we work in multiple collaborations, including um, the Los Angeles Human Trafficking Task Force, as well as the Asian Pacific Islander Human Trafficking Task Force. And in the US, these task forces are multidisciplinary work groups that have service providers 
and other, other um, folks who specialize in areas that those clients might need services from. Um, so we, we look at all kinds of things, including the family reunification, um, English as a second language, making sure that they have a community orientation, they're able to use public transportation, they can open bank accounts. Um, and, you know, of course, there's many legal remedies that I'm also going to go over. So the main immigration uh, relief, the main remedy for, for them in the legal sense is immigration relief, because in living as an undocumented immigrant in the United States is um, a very precarious situation because without a work permit uh, or visa or green card or citizenship, um, you know, you can't, you have to basically live on cash. The undocumented immigrant population is very vulnerable to exploitation. Um, and it, it's it's just a bad situation um, because they won't be able to find employment. And so they're more vulnerable to exploitation than, than other immigrants. The continued presence that Tanya had mentioned, that's a two-year status that, it, that was granted to our victims um, because of their cooperation in the investigation. But once that two years is up, if the investigation is not ongoing, then that would expire. But fortunately, um, Thai CDC and other legal service providers are able to apply for the T visa for victims of human trafficking. And for, for that, they must report to law enforcement and cooperate in an active investigation. Many times we have victims who report but the prosecutors and law enforcement are not interested in their cases. Um, and that's okay because we actually don't need a victim certification from law enforcement to apply for that T visa status. That T visa is good for four years or at, until the case is over. Um, when, when the criminal case is over, they're able to adjust their status to legal permanent residency to stay as a permanent resident in the United States and um, you know, continue to, to benefit. And then after five years of having the uh, legal permanent residency, they're able to um, apply for citizenship and become a US citizen and, and receive the benefits of that as well. There are other legal remedies um, that I think are not talked about enough aside from immigration relief. Um, I think many times law enforcement and nonprofit organizations and victim service providers are not collaborating enough. Um, those referrals of victims actually go both ways. We refer cases to law enforcement, but law enforcement also refers to the victim service providers. And we advocate for our victims when they do need to collaborate. Um, sometimes, um, you know, they have to testify before their traffickers, and that could be a very traumatizing event. Um, the legal process in the United States, of course, is very different than in Thailand, and they don't um, understand how to interact in that setting and what the rules and what the, the benefits are of being identified as a victim. And that's some of what I explain to my clients uh, when, when I come into contact with them and they're identified. We also have other programs um, in the criminal setting um, to vacate any of their past convictions if it's connected to the trafficking scheme. And this is something that a lot of the NGO legal service providers in the U.S. are focused on now so that victims can continue to live independently and not have problems in terms of finding employment and, of course, restitution. Now, uh, there was a lot of money that was seized, and Tanya mentioned a little bit about the uh, federal system for restitution where um, our victims from this case are entitled 
to receive some monies back. Thai CDC also provided the restitution claims on behalf of the victims that we represented. Um, it's, it's just paperwork. And then we're happy to help them do that paperwork um, to ensure that all the calculations are correct um, and all the facts are correct. But even aside from that, there could be additional civil lawsuits. Um, and I think most of our civil cases are labor trafficking cases. And we work very closely with other agencies in the United States, including the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, and also the US Department of Labor to make sure that any wage claims or other, other types of claims are uh, filed correctly, claims are filed correctly. Um, we're actually able to file third party claims on behalf of the victims that we have identified. And we've done so, so that these cases move a little bit faster. And many times those victims want to remain anonymous. So um, now if, if anyone's interested, um, the other large scale case we worked on was the Global Horizons Agricultural labor trafficking case. And we had, uh, we were able to um, give millions and millions of dollars back to those workers as recently as 2021, um, where the US Department of Justice was able to find more money from those companies, those agriculture companies that profited from their labor. Um, in 2021, we distributed 4.8 million to those workers. And this is a case that was finished back in 2012 or so. So, you know, a lot of these civil lawsuits go um, for a very long time, but at the end, you know, part of the picture, um, and this is what I'm doing here with the puzzles, is really making sure that we look for all venues of relief to make our victims whole again. And a lot of times that's finding the money. So uh, before we go to uh, audience's questions, I have um, several questions uh, for you for the presentation. Is this amazing work that you guys have done? And also it was a, an appalling case. I read uh, the materials that you sent us. And it's also, yeah, I, I've never heard of what happened in the U US, but um, in the case of trafficking, I myself worked with, um, Thai Women Network in the UK. And also we kind of experience a similar cases like that as well, but the number in Europe is quite small compared to the US. And also the operation is uh, smaller than I heard from, from you. So um, my, my question, the first, first question is that, um, can either of you discuss the new methods of sex trafficking recruitment you are seeing as that has been different in the past 10 to 15 years, uh, especially regarding the blurring between dead bondage and marriage migration. So I've seen recently that victims are not identifying. They don't self-identify as victims because in terms of consent, they see that they are aware that they're going to be uh, performing commercial sex. However, in the United States, even though they're aware there are other factors that are equally important. For example, um, they lost their autonomy in the US um, to deny any sex buyers because many times their customers were set up for them on some of the websites. They already feel as though, you know, this might be a cultural factor as well because they feel that they've consented to such. And in their mind, they're very fatalistic about, um, you know, getting themselves in that situation. Very interesting. And can you discuss the patterns of violence that, that seem uh, different from the past sex trafficking cases. Um, for example, technology or negative impact of mental health in making uh, testimonies. I'm sorry, the negative impact of violence? Uh, the negative impact of 
mental health in making testimonies like if they have to um, go through the process and then you know it's kind of a evoking their- right yeah so I, I think the whole process is traumatizing actually <laughs> it's it's not just the testimony but from many um many of the victims have been arrested by law enforcement and that in itself um, is a very scary process because they don't they're not able to access someone immediately that might speak Thai. They don't understand what's happening, even if they're still considered the victims. Um, I think a lot of misinformation in the Thai community in the U.S. also comes to play because traffickers, as well as other employers, use undocumented status as a weapon to hold over them. And many believe that they can be arrested and deported, but they have certain um, rights as victims that I had to explain. And I think much of the education that is provided by Thai CDC is human rights education because some of those victims come to um, such you know, egregious um, and, and traumatizing circumstances that they want to accept because of their cultural fatalism. Um, but at the same time, when they have a victim advocate like myself, they can be assured throughout the process. And when they have any questions, there's someone there that speaks their language. And not only that, because I'm an attorney, I can represent them on their legal matters and speak on their behalf. Now, many times when they have to testify in court, of course, it's very traumatizing to have to face your trafficker or if you're a victim of any crime to to face the perpetrator of that, that crime that was committed against you. And here, even in our family law court system in Los Angeles, we have Um, family law advocates that are allowed in court, even if they're not an attorney, to be present during um, like domestic violence victim testimony. Thank you very much. And also I want to learn um, about how do investigators and, you know, direct social services recover as as much as possible for, for restitution. Right. So law enforcement, their job is to find the money, (laughs) right? And we saw the process of how they do that. Now, I just want to make it clear that the restitution system in the U.S. doesn't depend solely on the monies that were recovered because there's a federal fund for victims, right? So what we have to prove during the restitution claim process is how much our victims um contributed to the profit of those employers or those traffickers right so if we because if we count in terms of minimum wage that's nothing compared to the amount of money that they were making their traffickers so we're actually allowed to calculate it based on um, that unjust enrichment to the traffickers and in addition to that other losses and also we talked a little bit about that trauma if they do have to go to see a clinical therapist we're able to claim um, the number of years that we estimate that those victims will have to go to therapy and also what what are the programs and funds for post testifying to support victims or survivors in the US and what are the pros and cons of that So the Thai Community Development Center and many other nonprofit victim service providers rely on federal funds that were um, allocated after the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. What do victims or survivors say they need and is it different different from the case, what the case is sheet? So I'll go ahead and kick that off. Um, I think first and foremost, our victims always have someone to take care of. <laughs> and what I'm what I'm saying is really a 
about their family members, whether it's an elderly uh, parent who is undergoing some kind of medical treatment or they, they're trying to raise their children um, back in Thailand. I think what's really happening is that they're concerned about others and not themselves. And if you find any one victim, they're not as motivated to come forward until they realize that there's a whole group of victims and they can actually make a greater impact um, if they come forward. And so they, they don't know what they can ask for in the beginning, but when we tell them that we will protect them, we will provide them with benefits to mention that uh, at the, <clears throat> at, during the course of the investigation, um, there actually is a victim service um, appointed person um, through law enforcement, right? So there is a victim service coordinator that helped those victims, but because of the language barrier and the trust relationship, victims prefer to go through a Thai Community Development Center to coordinate, um, and they, they help with everything. Um, including scheduling flights if they have to come into town to testify, to hotel reservations, to reimbursement claims, because they did get a daily rate um, when they have to go to Minneapolis to testify um, or um, go get interviewed. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important because most of these cases are the new migrants right, like the newly um, migrated people and they're not, you know, familiar maybe with the system in the US and they don't know the language, they don't know where to go. So the organization like Thai CDC is kind of like a bridge to help them with, you know, the nitty gritty, the language and the, and the culture. Right, culture and sometimes they don't trust me too because I, I've been cold calling people which just, means that I call them without knowing them beforehand. And they ask me, how did you find my phone number? I just got a new one. And mm -hmm. I have to tell them that I'm in touch with law enforcement that is trying to get a hold of them. And sometimes they just don't believe me. They think I might be um, part of the trafficking organization. Um, but after some time consulting with others, we they've um, even Googled some videos where I was featured on Thai news when mm -hmm. I was distributing settlement money for a different uh, trafficking case and then call me back and say, oh, I know who you are now. <laughs> so actually, it's very important to, you know, cross those international lines so that we're, we're also known um, to those Thai, Thai nationals in Thailand. That's all for my uh, questions. I think we are will be open for the audience's questions. Uh, you can type in the chat if you have any questions for our speakers, or you can raise your hands and I'll enable uh, your, your microphone. I think we have the first questions already in the chat um, sent directly. Um, after the lawsuit, did victims want to apply for green card visa for themselves and their family or head back home to Thailand? So the main reason to stay in the United States is fear of retaliation from traffickers. And most of those traffickers are in Thailand where they fear for their personal safety and their family's safety. And one of the reasons that the T visa exists in the United States is to protect those victims from retaliation from their traffickers. Everyone can ask the questions uh, in chat. So if there's no question now, I think I'm going to ask uh, a little bit more of my question. So maybe it's a big question, but I just want to know how can the US and Thai government, uh, in your opinion, can prevent human trafficking from happening in the future and, and what type of mechanisms or law should be in place? I have lots of thoughts, right. but I'm going to keep it brief because, you know, 
when, when I work with victims here in the US, I have a lot of benefits because of the legislation that has been passed in favor of the victims. However, I know that in Thailand, there is no such immigration relief. And once cases are over, many victims must return to their home country where they may face retaliation from their traffickers. So I think that's one of those key reasons why we're able to um, you know, have those victims come forward because of course, all victims are very reluctant to come forward, especially in sex trafficking cases. Um, and we also offer, you know, a plethora of victim services and resources so that they can become independent and reunify with their families here in the United States. Thank you very much. So we have a questions from the audience. Santani okay. oh. Hi. Uh Good morning from Thailand. Uh, I'm a prosecutor. I, I, you hear me clearly? Uh, thank you very much for your very fruitful presentation. Uh, I have wondered about uh, the, the nature of recent developments on online child sexual exploitation. Have you have like, any inside information that how we can cooperate uh, to investigate? or uh, tackle the online child sexual exploitation. And also there is the issue about uh, processing of child pornography. This is a considered trafficking offense in the US. I mean, uh, when some organized criminal group, uh, they just process, uh, uh, retrieve child sexual pornography and send to other countries. Uh, and we found it, and uh, sometimes that our Thai uh, authority would like to shut them off trafficking in person, but there's a debate whether is it uh, considered exploitation of children. If it is exploitation of children, you don't need the, the way, the means, right, for uh, element of trafficking, but some still, still hustle whether uh, just possessing, selling, uh, retrieve and sell and distribute child pornography is a trafficking in person offense in the US. Thank you. So I have a more academic type question about um, how can uh, the academic research community play a role in, you know, uh, counter trafficking and anti trafficking of sex workers. I really believe that this effort to combat human trafficking and slavery is a multidisciplinary effort and have had great partnerships with academic institutions and the way that they conduct their research in terms of perspective um, can really help the passage of increased legislation to protect victims and uncover what is really going on because I think typically the media controls the narrative of what human trafficking looks like in the United States and abroad, unfortunately. Um, but I think that once more information is out there for us to utilize, it's more data to analyze and to send to the people that make those rules for us and maybe in other countries as well, um, the, the better. That way we can control the narrative based on the actual trends of human trafficking. Any more questions from the audience? I also wanted to mention a great partnership with a uh, professor here in California um, that studies uh, human trafficking and transit and you know how people are being moved because many times trafficking victims are discovered along the way you know at airports or other other places and you know this is really about the movement of people to um for you know at their expense so that others the traffickers can profit Right. So how how is that actually happening? You know, and we've seen in other cases, um, some immigration systems are being taken advantage of, like the guest worker visa um, are 
you know, there's immigration fraud, but how how are these people actually being moved and what are what are the trends? So that would also be an interesting perspective. Um, I was curious that in the civilian civilian perspective, like how can we do like what can we do in everyday lives? How can we spot like you know traffickers? Because I heard, um, I think I heard someone you know give uh, knowledge about how can you spot traffickers at the airport or something like that. But I'm not sure if that's you know what we should do or how can we help the law enforcement so on and so forth. Do you have any suggestions for, um, you know, lay people? How can they help? That's, yeah. Do you have any suggestions? Sure. So, you know, I, I we also train um, because we want to increase community awareness and reporting. Um, so, you know, I know we, in the U.S., we have our National Human Trafficking Hotline. And, you know, Thai CDC actually got referrals from Thai NGOs. Um, because family members in Thailand reported to them that their family me members are missing. Mm -hmm. And those actually turned out to be trafficking cases. Now, um, I think there are certain red flags that you could definitely look out for, including, um, you know, someone that you might notice that has limited mobility, like they're not allowed to go outside, whether it's a domestic service um, or, you know, someone that is, um, maybe they have un unaccounted, uh, like no reason that they should have bruises or scars or things like that. Um, and sometimes people that um, don't have their own um, like passport or travel documents, um, you know, those are those key red flags that I would look out for. And of course, if you see any of those things, um, please report it to a local organization or law enforcement that specializes in human trafficking. Those are helpful suggestion that um, we can use to help you know, combating um, human trafficking. I think we have another question from Kunnakarat. I saw you raise your hand. All right. I think the questions that you asked already been answered, but I have one more question related to this one. Uh, I'm kind of curious about what kind of the anti-cyber trafficking prevention measures in front of innovation or handbooks or guidelines to raise awareness of this crime for you know, potential victims, particularly children, because nowadays a lot of them go online, right? So how would you really raise this kind of awareness? Thank you. Any more questions or comments? If not, I think we can close because we have received um, quite a number of uh, questions already. And I believe that our speakers are quite tired because they are <laughs> up uh, quite late. So I just want to say thank you for your presentation. It's also very eye-opening and you know very useful for, for all of us here. And also, also thank you C Junction and GAATW for your collaboration and also in-house seminar of IPSR for you know, collaborating this and also Ajak Sudara who is a lead collaborator in this uh, endeavor. So thank you very much again, Kumpanida uh, for your presentation. Thank you. So goodbye and see you um, next event on Wednesday, C Mobilities. Bye. Thank you. Bye.